I welcome everybody to the uh, Regional Transportation Committee of Denver Regional Council of Governments for Tuesday, September 20th, uh, 2022. I call this meeting to order. The first item of business is public comment. Uh, before we go to public comment, though, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege and say happy birthday to Doug Rex. Happy oh. birthday. Oh. This is your birthday, right? It is. Okay. I just randomly guessed out of 300, <laughs> out of 365 days of the year, I was actually right. Like, who knew? So, You're good. <laughs> uh, so uh, do we have anybody signed up for public comment? Uh, seeing no public comment, we'll move on to number three, which is the meeting summary of last month uh, when we were uh, still virtual, I believe. But by the way, welcome back in person, everyone. Uh, does anybody have any comments or edits, corrections, or comments to offer on the uh, meeting summary from last month? Seeing none, we will move on to our first action item, 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan Update. Uh, with the air quality conformity and state greenhouse gas planning standard compliance. And I've been told that Alvin Vidal Sanchez is going to do this by Ron. You're going to introduce him? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, wanted to introduce Alvin Vidal Sanchez. All of you um, know him and have seen, seen him at these before. Alvin's filling in for Jacob this morning to go over the regional transportation plan. We're excited to bring this to you uh, finally for a recommendation for board action tomorrow evening. Alvin's going to go through the process we've been we have really I just before he launches in I just want to express our appreciation for all of you. I know you've sat through countless discussions and meetings um, as we work through the, those issues and just appreciate your attention to this really important item and we're happy to bring this to you. Alvin. Thank you. Morning everyone. Hear me okay in the back? So uh, before you today is our 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. There are actually 20 appendices as part of this document. We're only going to highlight two on this just because they are pretty important to our planning process. Um, our first is Appendix S, which is our air quality conformity determination. So we do this every time we amend the plan, every time we update the plan, every four years. And then our new appendix, Appendix T, is our greenhouse gas transportation report. This is a new document that we have in the plan related to the greenhouse gas planning standard and our state requirements for documentation. We've been on, we've been on this, we've been on this uh, development process for about nine months now. That started back in December of 2021, January 2022, when we did our call for amendments, uh, which we do typically every year between our four-year update. Since then, we've worked on mitigation measures with y'all. We've coordinated with project sponsors. Uh, what are some strategic changes we could make to projects? We've looked at how to represent programmatic investments in our travel model. We've drafted a whole new appendix. In August, we had our main public review period, which included public meetings, uh, stakeholder meetings. And then here we are in September. We've actually already presented to the Transportation Commission, so we do want to express thanks for that. We had a great conversation last week. TAC has unanimously recommended approval. We're now here before you, and we look to go to the board tomorrow. And all of this is in anticipation of meeting our October 1st, 2022 deadline from the state. So a quick overview of the greenhouse gas planning standard. You all have seen this slide before, just a quick refresher. It was adopted last December. It applies to CDOT and the five MPOs in the state of which Dr. Cog is one. Our RTP has to meet emissions reduction levels for four analysis years. We have to have that updated plan adopted by October 1st of this year. And the emission reduction levels are from a baseline and the rule defines that as our adopted plan as modeled. So how our plan was adopted last April, April, 2021. Um, there are emission reduction levels for each of the five MPOs and CDOT uh, for the four analysis years. During our development process, working with the public, we realized these million metric ton values weren't intuitive. So throughout the process, we did provide an equivalency for these. So I'll just run through those four that you can see on the screen. We decided to show uh, what the million metric tons actually means in terms of gas powered cars being converted to electric cars. Uh, there are a number of other different ways that you could look at this metric. Uh, you can go to that link at the bottom left of your screen at some point and see some other ways to see this uh, acres saved uh, from cropland, um, trash that's been diverted to recycling from landfill, how, many, how much energy is coming from wind turbines. So there's a number of different ways you can look at that. 
During our process, we realized it was going to take a number of different strategies to meet these emission reduction levels. So we uh, ended up layering quite a few of them, and some of these actually have more detail behind them, and I'll go over a few of those. But the key strategies that we looked at to meet the emission reduction levels are programmatic investments. So what we adopted in the plan last April 2021, what we've been able to add to the plan through our work with project sponsors and changes to the financial plan. Major project changes, so working with project sponsors on those strategic scope changes for projects. We've been able to update our land use adjustments for uh, the near term at least, recognizing that the region's growing a little differently than we first saw it and when we first developed the plan. Uh, taking into account telework adjustments, so being consistent with the state's assumptions. And then the last piece to meet that reduction level were our mitigation measures as defined by the state. We went through four key steps in this process. The first was just figuring out what our baseline was. So what are the networks in our travel model? What are our regionally significant projects? Uh, what were the land use forecasts that were adopted at the moment? Uh, from there, we then looked at how we could update our modeling. So how are we going to represent programmatic investments in our travel model, um, taking into account that telework adjustment? Step three was then looking at major project changes. Um, what can we change in our project and program investment mix to help meet these targets as well? And then the last piece were those mitigation measures. So working with y'all, what was most appropriate for the region, recognizing that our travel model can capture some of those that are defined by Policy Directive 1610. So we looked at specifically policy ones that the region could support. Uh, one of the details related to representing programmatic investment in our travel model is just how we uh, how we represent all that money that is going to smaller scale projects that aren't actually modeled. So sidewalks, bike lanes, transit service. Um, or improves transit service. So for each of these, uh, our staff worked to identify what was the most appropriate attractiveness factor in our travel model that we could adjust. Um, for each of these, it corresponds to a different piece of the model. And so at the end of the day, um, we were able to make adjustments appropriately throughout our travel model that represented our best planning work. In terms of project modifications, there were four major ways that we changed projects in the RTP. First was modifying those managed lane projects. So uh, removing, uh, removing a few, um, changing the scope to be focused on safety, operational transit improvements instead. For Dr. Cog administered railway projects, we looked at the removal of the six laning components of those. So working with project sponsors, what could we do on those corridors to keep investment there, uh, make some changes, make some improvements, but removing those six lane pieces. We also adjusted our bus rapid transit network. So we're looking to complete five BRTs by 2030. Through that, we advanced two BRTs, East Colfax Extension, into the 2020-2029 staging period, and the uh, Broadway-Lincoln BRT into the middle staging period. So beginning some pre-work on that one. And then the last piece was some additional programmatic investment. So that's a combination of reallocating funding from projects, as well as making some changes to the financial plan. So that's an additional $900 million going to programmatic investments, $500 million by 2030, and then another $200 million each by 2040 and 2050. So some significant uh, project investment mix changes through our work with project sponsors. Then the last piece was the mitigation action plan. You'll have also seen this slide before, but just a quick refresher that it was our last step to close that gap that we couldn't meet through all of our other strategies. Um, it documents our approach to uh, using these mitigation measures. They're done at a regional level. Um, it's also a small fraction of the region, so that web map we developed was just a proxy measure for just showing where, um, showing the small amount of the region that it would actually be impacted by. Uh, we do think we have plenty of time to implement these over time. We don't actually need these till 2030, so there's also an annual reporting period where we can see how we're making progress on these. And as we've mentioned, that they're entirely voluntary, so they're not required to be implemented in any specific place, but staff stands ready to assist any jurisdiction uh, that wants to explore these further for their area. So we had uh, five, five uh, mitigation measures, uh, increased residential density, increased job density, mixed use transit oriented development, uh, reduce or eliminate minimum parking requirements and adopting local complete street standards. For each of these, we did document what the uh, metric ton value for that reduction was. Um, these aren't metric tons. Some of the values you see, we do say million metric tons. Uh, for each of these, we also divided them into those analysis years. So for each of these, you can see uh, how much applies to 2030, how much applies to 2040, 2050. So adding up all that together, uh, we'll look at the fourth row on this table, total GHG reductions. Once we add up our project changes, the mitigation measures, representing programmatic investments in our travel model, 
um, taking into account some of the work that CDOT was doing related to busting. Uh, we get our total GHG reductions for each of those four analysis years. And the key is to be greater than, higher than, um, than the, the red row on the screen. So for each of these, we're looking to see a value higher than what is outlined in the GHG rule. And for each of these, we do meet the emission reduction levels for the four analysis years. Um, we also don't need mitigation measures for 2025, so that's why you're not seeing any values related to the mitigation action plan in 2025. We don't need them for that. We have met those reduction levels just through our update to modeling and the programmatic investments we've been able to include. So I already touched on this. Um, our plan is made up of multiple components. When we adopted it back in April of 2021, there's our main plan, four chapters, about 180 pages, and then 19 appendices at that point. And those cover everything from our financial plan assumptions, our equity environmental assessments, our air quality conformity determinations, performance measures. For our 2022 update, we have made some select changes to a few of those. So updating our financial plan, making some minor text corrections to the coordinated transit plan, um, updating our Appendix S air quality conformity determination, since we do do that every time we amend the plan, update the plan. And then we do have our new GHG transportation report. So that's the hub for all the information that's been presented in this presentation. If you want to see more detail related to how we were representing those programmatic investments, um, how we use our travel model, the moves model, uh, what was our public engagement during this 30-day period? The Appendix T, Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report, is where that all sits. I mentioned August was when we had our public engagement period, so that ran from August 7th to September 6th. That included an online engagement site, our social pinpoint site. Um, we wanted to provide folk a number of different ways to engage with us, what was most comfortable for them. So that included being able to mark up actual PDFs, provide comments directly on the plan, that included being able to email our public engagement planner or our project manager, and then also uh, participating on a discussion board and idea wall on that online engagement site. We also did five public meetings. Two of those had simultaneous uh, Spanish interpretation. And then we also had our public hearing, our formal public hearing, September 7th with simultaneous American Sign Language and Spanish interpretation. So trying to give folk a number of different ways to participate in our process over the 30 days. But we ended up doing a number of different promotion just through Dr. Cog. We had a number of e-blasts, both in English and Spanish this round. Um, we ended up figuring out a better way to do our Spanish interpretation uh, and e-blast promotion through that. We also promoted across our social media channels, so LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, those also included Spanish translation for those posts as well, so trying to reach a number of different folks throughout the region. There was also some external promotion, so uh, there was some media coverage uh, through our plan process. We also uh, uh, saw some of our local governments putting out the, our, our online engagement work. So uh, the far left image is actually Arapahoe County's um, newsletter. So I just want to thank all of our local governments who were doing work as well. Uh, while we were highlighting this one, we know y'all were also doing some of y'all's own work. And just want to thank y'all for promotion of that. And then a final slide of just some summary metrics that we looked at, we report on now, just so we understand how this plan process compared to some of our previous ones. Uh, it was a 31-day public review period. We had three e-blasts. Across those nine months, we met with committees and boards about 22 times. Um, for our sub-regional forums, we met 21 times. Uh, we also reconvened our civic advisory group. If you remember that from our plan adoption process that was made up of historically disadvantaged, disadvantaged groups. So we reconvened them to work, walk them through the GHG process, get them involved, and make sure we were hearing from folk we might typically, not typically hear in our transportation planning process. So they met four times throughout this planning process. Um, at our for formal public hearing, we had 11 speakers. At our five public meetings, we ended up having 11 attendees. But I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the different metrics and reports that we, we show for our engagement. We ended up receiving uh, almost 350 comments. There were some general themes across them. One was just general support, um, great work on the plan. The second one was support again, but wish you had done more, um, less emphasis on road or highway expansion. There was also some opposition to the changes that were being made to the plan, so more roadway highway expansion was desired from uh, some of the comments. Some were just technical, a lot of project-based, um, or just from project sponsors. And then there was quite a bit of engagement between commenters so we have our idea wall, our discussion board. Folk were actually able to comment on those comments, like or dislike those comments. So that was a new piece in this planning process was folk engaging with each other online. 
And then um, as part of our process, we do record all of those written comments and provide a response. Um, if we made a change in the plan or just thank you for your comment, um, that's also included in the meeting packet. And for folks who want to see more, that's also one of the sub-appendices of the Greenhouse Gas Transportation Report. Based on the public review period and the comments that we did receive, we ended up making a couple of revisions. Uh, one, uh, the first piece are those staff initiated ones, so that included a correction to Table 1 in our GHG transportation report, just a correction for the 2025 analysis year. I mentioned we didn't need mitigation measures. One of those first drafts did include showing mitigation measures on that, but they weren't needed. Um, copy editing of the page 11 of the GHG report, so just a sentence fragment. Uh, correction in one of the sub-appendices for the model outputs. And then based on a comment we received related to Table 3.1, which is where our projects and our programs are listed, we did make changes to the project descriptions related to uh, a few of the Arapahoe County projects, just referencing transit service on those and reflecting that in that table. So we do have a proposed motion before I get to that. I just want to uh, offer CDOT an opportunity to also discuss uh, their work related to the GHG transport uh, PhD planning standard and their work on the 10-year plan since that's been done in coordination with them as well. Okay. Morning. It's been a while since I've used this microphone. Did I do it right? Okay. Uh, Jessica Mickelbust is here too. I, this may be your first RTC meeting in person. That's possible in the flesh. <laughs> It is, yes, and I'm lost in a parking garage labyrinth somewhere, so apologies for being late. <laughs> I honestly am not sure where I am under this building somewhere. Um, so this is really exciting. I think many of you have heard and are familiar with our 10-year plan. We've spent a lot of time working in partnership with Dr. Cog to align the plan with our greenhouse gas rulemaking, align our project portfolio to meet the requirements of the greenhouse gas rulemaking and as well as keep you know leveraging and taking care of our aging infrastructure as well as doing some really creative looking at how we can um, kind of adjust the way that people are moving in the Denver metro area so what you have on the screen before you is our central projects those are the these are the notable project changes that we made in the plan although some dollars kind of shifted around in other spaces if you like that nitty-gritty I'll give you a, an opportunity to to analyze kind of side-by-side -side spreadsheets. But um, just at a higher level, um, the region-wide arterial transit and BRT improvements, very exciting. Um, this is $100 million of infusion into that line item that originally was set at $70 million to total out at $170 million. We're really looking to leverage grant opportunities. We've got the Dr. Cog tip call coming up, so we're really strategically looking at how to fully fund and get those corridors up and running. The expansion of I-270 remains a commitment in our plan, as well as uh, the bridge bundle, which we have out right now to replace eight aging critical bridge um, structures. The central I-25, which we define as 23rd to kind of Alameda, uh, we have shifted some dollars um, kind of away from the widening part of that, and we're really gonna focus on the non-capacity safety and operational improvements to that part of the corridor, so recognizing that I-25 is vital to the economy of Denver. Uh, I-70 Floyd Hill, really excited. We won $100 million in a mega grant, so that's the largest grant that CDOT has ever gotten from the DOT, and we're just thrilled to have that and put in our bank account to get that project a few steps closer. I-25 North, 84th Avenue to 104th Avenue, also we call that segment two. Um, we've added, we've actually shifted $20 million in strategic funding into the early years to really dive deep into the um, design and determination of the appropriate alternative for that corridor. And then if you were listening at Transportation Commission, we're committed that once we determine the appropriate alternative for safety and uh, multimodal um, operations in that segment, that we will fund that through some creative financing, whether that's TIFIA or leveraging some other financial sources, but that was really great news for segment two. Uh, the Eisenhower Johnson Memorial Tunnel, we've all driven through that many times. We are, the first four years of the plan had $50 million. We've got another $100 million going forward to take care of our tunnel. And I made a little plug yesterday, but we, uh, we have some really critical work going on the next four weeks at the tunnel. We will have um, operational uh, lane closures from um, 11, p.m. to 5 a.m. So if you need to make a midnight journey through the mountains, just be aware you might have a little delay in your trip, but lots of dollars being invested in the tunnel, which is just really needed and we're excited about. So 
Um, those are the highlights for Region 1. As promised, if you're really excited to do a comparison side-by-side -side of how things changed from the prior plan to this plan, your opportunity is in your packet. This says draft. The exciting part, our commission has adopted it. The draft watermark will be removed. And if you're curious to dive deeper into any of these projects, you'll see there's a little column with like blue underlines all the way on the right. Those are fact sheets for each of those projects. You can click on that little hyperlink and it will take you to a fact sheet that specifically addresses and talks about that project. So plenty of information. And if you ever have questions about our project portfolio, you can reach out to me or any of our staff in Region 1. Chair, if I can, I'll just add, um, as with Dr. Cog, we were uh, able to show full compliance with the greenhouse gas rule for our obligation, uh, which is not a, a region one's obligation is more covered by Dr. Cog. But in addition to uh, adopting the plan last week, the commission also confirmed both CDOT's compliance as well as Dr. Cog's because they have a high role in reviewing the greenhouse gas uh, do you want me to touch on, on this? I, I can from a broader perspective. This is just the uh, projects for Region 4. Um, the notable uh, items here are the sort of lack of changes um, for the projects up in this region, with the exception of some roundabouts. They'll be replacing, I believe, some signalized interchanges. Um, and then uh, continuation of the work on Segment 5, in addition to looking at financing for Segment 2. We announced last week that we will be looking at TIFIA uh, to com fully complete and deliver Segment 5. Uh, and then we've got some pavement problems out in the Eastern Plains. Uh, and so we are de uh, devoting some serious funding to fixing the concrete out there. Thank you. Commissioner Stan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to say on behalf of us commissioners and the TC how much we appreciated Ron Jacobs, Alvin's work. Um, this has been an epic effort over a year. And the intense coordination with CDOT, and it wasn't all just take it, it was a lot of give and take. So thank you very much for your effort. Thank you. Uh, I want to add our thanks to, on behalf of the board, to our staff. I think uh, a little less than a year ago when we uh, tackled this, it would look like one of those things where you would put OMG, we have to do this. Can we get to the finish line? And it took a lot of hard work and cooperation with all of our partners to get to this point. Um, so um, I uh, am sorry that I was out of town during the public hearing, um, but my understanding from my briefing on it is that it went very well. And to think that we were at that point Remembering back in November and December when we started out on this is pretty amazing. So thank you to Doug, Ron, Jacob, Alvin, everybody on staff uh, for all the hard work on this. Um, Mr. Silverstein, go ahead. Thank you. And um, what will Central I-25? What, what what is the vision now that it's uh, it's changed from the original concept of you know more lane and uh, and flow improvements? What what could it look like? Well, what could it look like? That's, that's a big question. But I think what we're focusing right now, we're working and talking about doing some reconnecting communities grant opportunities where we really look at kind of um, shifting the way people can get across I-25. As far as the throughput of I-25, we're going to spend a little bit of time really diving deep into where those um, specific safety and operational concerns are. We have the 23rd and Spear Bridge projects right now. So we have some opportunities to look at some of the ramp configurations, um, whether some um, collector distributor roads might be appropriate in some of those areas. There's a lot of access to the highway kind of along that segment. Does all of that make sense? Um, can we consolidate, combine? So there's a, it's a good question, and we're still kind of diving into that. So hopefully over the next year, we'll kind of define specifically what that will look like. Okay, great. Look forward to it. Thanks. I think as a frequent user of 25 between Santa Fe and either 6th or Colfax, I can attest to uh, Mr. Rex and I have talked about this a few times. Uh, the original Valley Highway project, the first phase ended at 8th Avenue, and that's why that exit entrance is still there. And it really it reminds me of the pinch point at Bryant and 6th Avenue trying to get onto I-25. 
we have the same situation there. Why, why do we still have 8th Avenue, for instance, as, as an access point when the 6th is right there? So that's one of the things I certainly hope that CDOT's looking at, operational improvements. Any other questions, uh, Jeff? Mr. Coleman, sorry, Jeff. No, no problem at all. Alvin, could you go to slide 11, which seemed to be a pretty important slide, at least for me, and I know this is probably late to the game, but boy, when I looked at these very precise numbers, um, some of them made a lot of sense, but could you explain what reduce or eliminate minimum parking requirements, which is clearly more of a benefit than everything combined, what does that consist of? Question one, I got a couple others. No worries. Um, so uh, for each of these, we ended up doing some work uh, with, with staff, with stakeholders, what was most appropriate, where was it most appropriate. Um, on this one, what we're really looking at, for each of these, there's like some sub-strategies. So this is a pretty broad category, but um, in this case, uh, it, it, it would apply to, uh, I believe it was residential, commercial, um, and it was scaled for, for the level of development. Um, the second piece, I don't actually recall the title, Ron, Doug. So what you're saying is that we're just going to get rid of it. If I build a four-story building, I don't have to have 200 spaces on the end. Mr. Jeff, yeah, I wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't go that. It's certainly not. Certainly but but not. that's what that consists of. Yeah. So, uh, right. Um, require a minimum amount of parking to be built, say yeah, per unit, right? So per residential unit, a certain number of parking spaces, per thousand square feet of commercial space, a certain number of spaces. This strategy would look very strategically around the region at places around transit station areas, for instance, where maybe because of, because of that alternative access, a development doesn't need as much. So this would say in those locations, maybe get rid of or reduce the minimum parking requirements to reflect the fact that not everyone that might reside or visit that location would have to drive, right? So then, therefore, you might not need as much parking. Um, the other aspect of that is, um, in many cases, those local, those local development codes also don't put a cap on the amount of parking that a developer can provide as part of their private development. And so this would say in, in locations where it makes sense, Maybe you put a cap and you say you may not build more than this many spaces per unit. And again, we looked very strategically around the region or at specific locations. And then we have a lot of work ahead of us collectively to do to work with our local jurisdictions, to work with the development community, to refine that um, and to refine those areas about where those will make sense and how they might get implemented at local level. A lot of number. Um, conversely, on the far right, Multi, you know, the adopting local complete street standards is a negligible benefit. Um, what's comprised in there? And then I'll just get the last question is, where is all this investment in BRT and its reduction in greenhouse show up? Right. So uh, for adopt local complete street standards, you're correct, you're 656 metric tons. Um, but in our work, we realized that those small amounts really did matter. And so this was one of those pieces. Why you're seeing such detailed numbers around each of these is those small amounts really do matter in this work. Uh, part of what we were looking at with mitigation measures also was just what's some planning work that the region could continue to implement. All of uh, Many of our jurisdictions already do some of this work. What could we help facilitate further in the region? So um, then the second piece of your... Well, where's BRT? I mean, we're making a huge investment in BRT. Right. Goes up in a whole different area. Yes, yeah. yeah, correct. So there were a number of different uh, places uh, we we worked to to meet these reduction levels. BRT specifically was around those major uh, project changes. So uh, in advancing a couple of those corridors, um, having those five complete by 2030, those would sit in this uh, 2050 RTP update modeling. And then we also recognized that our model doesn't capture everything that might come with the BRT project. So we did uh, make some assumptions around uh, how much of that investment isn't captured in a model. Where could it sit in this work? So then that would sit under, um, I, I guess, fill that first row programmatic funding. So uh, we did make some assumptions around the BRT projects. What percent are we not capturing? But if I look at on this chart, then BRT is still substantially less of an impact to greenhouse gas parking strategy. Um, I, yeah, Mr. Coleman, I actually don't believe that's true. It's included in, as Alvin was saying, the, the programmatic and the network changes. Yeah, so yeah. the mitigation measures are totaling about what in 2030, um, 
one tenth of a, a million metric tons. I believe that's the measure of greenhouse gas. All of the other changes, I'm going to put my glasses on now, are totaling, you know, over over uh, 0.7 million metric tons uh, in the pl from the planning changes. So really, the mitigation measures in total are representing less than 10 percent or so of the of the reductions in in greenhouse gas emissions from this planning work. Slide 11 is the second line. Correct. That's the that's all that's all of the mitigation action plan. The third line. Thank you. Thank you, Director Williams. Am I here? Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. You know, Jeff brought up a good point because BRT is so important. This is a quantum shift of what we're doing that maybe you should. Put that in there, then. I'm a CD, C dot bus thing, and I'll bet BR better than that in greenhouse. Thank you. Can that be pulled out, um, Mr. Chair, Commissioner um, Stanton. No, uh, unfortunately, we can't. We model so the way the, we model the okay. network, we model the entire regional network. We don't model individual projects. So this is really looking at the entire regional transportation network and the system um, as a total. So um, a bit challenging to pick out individual pieces of that and um, precisely identify the specific um, allocation to specific individual projects. I'm not saying specific. I'm just saying when you give this talk, he brought up a good point. BRTs need to be emphasized. That's a yes, thank huge you. shift. Yeah, appreciate that clarification. Yep. Director Williams. Thanks. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Um, can you go back to slide 11? Okay. The, the last one has a really nice picture with it. And I did note that we have some plans to do roundabouts. And I just feel like I'm obligated to represent bicyclists and pedestrians for whom roundabouts are horrendous. As somebody who spends a lot of time in Lowry, I can attest to the fact that a roundabout is a death trap if you're on a bicycle or if you're walking. And so um, I, I'm sure we will move toward better solutions for those, but I feel obligated to speak for those parts of our constituency. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, I, if you go back to the previous slide, again, I just wanted to clarify, because I just talked to staff about this to make sure I understood, but uh, so the BRT improvements would actually be in that top line, yeah. right? So it's included in the modeling work itself. We have no way of breaking out or even having an, a true understanding of what the greenhouse gas emissions reductions are to any one project, right? It's in Almost is near impossible to do that. It's within the margin of error. So uh, all of our all the um, investments within our region are included in that top line stuff. Most notably, I'll be honest with you, the signal timing was uh, was a significant um, uh, greenhouse gas mover. Thank you, Director Cook. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> um, so, quick question sort of along the lines that Ron was talking about with parking. To the extent that we are leaning on um, bike and ped, for example, to help shift some of the travel off of the roads, does, you know, recognizing you can't within a specific project, but do does the scoring system for particular uh, projects take into account, let's say, proximity to transit? So would one project, you know, bike and trail pro project, or bike trail project that uh, connects to an RTD rapid transit line or something, would that score higher or how are you embedding the bike and ped system within the larger transportation system, I guess is what. Yep. Um, so our applications for the TIP do take into account the different networks. Um, it does highlight, uh, I believe in the current TIP, it was like the, the current regional BRT network. It does the project uh, in touch. Um, is it near those type of investments? We do look at the active transportation network. Uh, we also ask about our regional complete streets toolkit, whether any of the investments you're making are also going to are related to improvements coming out of that that new toolkit that we have. So uh, I would say it's embedded in our application process. I don't know if it's specifically scored, but it's as part of the the context and the information that scores get into in scoring a project for a particular uh, in the particular pieces of the application. 
Thank you. There's no other. Uh, oh, Ms. White, go ahead. I, I wanted to switch topics. I'm impressed by the uh, efforts to engage Spanish speaking audiences. I wonder how successful that was in terms of the participation you got. So I'm, I want to borrow some of what you did. <laughs> I wonder if it worked. We didn't get any written comments in Spanish. Um, we are looking at how we can uh, report from our virtual meetings, whether we did have any attendees sit within the Spanish language room. Um, so we've also just held a debrief among staff, see how that went virtually, um, how we can continue that progress moving forward. But it was our first time using simultaneous Spanish interpretation for both the virtual meetings and the public hearing. Um, we've learned some new lessons related to our Spanish e-blasts. Um, we recognize providing two e-blasts to the same uh, audiences might not be the best way to get that, uh, that um, notice out. So we've just also learned some lessons internally on how we can begin promoting to more places, more consistently, uh, more streamlined in our own, our own e-blast creation. I could just add, because it's, it's really important. It's a really important effort, but it was a first effort. Yeah. And so we're not sort of judging whether we should keep doing it by sort of the level of participation this time. We think it's really important to keep at it. And as people become more familiar with that opportunity, we believe we'll get more participation. So, Director Conklin. Just having chaired the, the public hearing, even if there weren't a lot of people that took advantage of it, I think having it there and and building on that is is a positive, and and both the sign language and the real time uh, interpretation I think were incredibly positive. And and in terms of the meeting itself, it also was not clunky. It it didn't you know cause problems in in the process. So I compliment staff in in making it happen. Thank you. Other. Uh... Mr. Silverstein, go ahead. Yes, thank you. And and just to follow on to the uh, discussion on on BRT and the uh, and the parking assumptions in the plan, I think um, from an air quality perspective, not just climate, but also um, summertime ozone and other air quality matters, um, BRT is is foundational to, that allows. Um, as well as trans the transit system and the regular bus system and all the other um, infrastructure pieces allow the other things to come true in the future. Because if you don't have those, you're not providing the options for folks to get around in a different way. And so I think that that's why it's very difficult to call out BRT, for example, to say, here's its benefit. I mean, you could have estimates on ridership and say that and then calculate out those emission reductions. And that by, might be a way to present that. But um, really, BRT, uh, if you're get, getting people on, on the bus, on other forms of transit, then you're allowing those other things to come true. People can leave their cars at home. You don't need large parking lots or as big of a parking lot, for example, or people may not even choose to have cars like many in the younger generation. And then um, one, one point just to from a, a put the, uh, the parking restrictions into some context, I've been working with a, uh, a large developer in, in uh, Douglas County that are essentially they're, they're, they're fighting with um, one of the local governments that they want to build their, this really innovative project um, that's um, related to, um, uh, to space and, and tourism and education. And they want to have a car-free campus, but they're being told you have to have parking you know, you, we won't permit you without parking. And they said, we don't want it. We're right off two transit lines. We want people to take advantage of transit. Yes, but of course, there's going to be a road network for delivery and for some level of parking. But they're saying, we don't want to spend this kind of money on asphalt and parking garages. And, um, and so they would appreciate that, um, you know, that there is flexibility on parking. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a compromise somewhere in the middle. But um, there's, there's many examples that... Uh, um, developers don't want the expense of parking and want to take advantage of, of transit networks. So it, it can work both ways. Thank you. No other comments, I'd entertain a motion. Um, there's one in the packet on attachment B. Would anyone like when it's up on the screen as well? Director Shaw. Thank you. I move to recommend to the board the draft 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan and Associated Dr. Cog PM10 Conformity Determination, Denver Southern Subarea, eight hour ozone conformity de determination, and greenhouse gas transportation report. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Director Williams. Any further discussion? 
Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Say no. Are there any abstentions? Seeing none, uh, pass unanimously. Thank you. Now our next item is uh, the uh, recommendations for the 22 to 25 tip. And uh, oh, Todd Cottrell is going to do this. I didn't see you, Todd. <laughs> I'm here. Thank you. Right. All right, thank you. Uh, so quickly before I begin, I did want to quickly outline the remaining action items in your agenda because they all do deal with the current 22 to 25 tip. Uh, and certainly just want to make sure there was no confusion as we step through this entire process. Um, so the action item that I'm about to go through deals with the call to recommendations. Um, this is very similar to recommendations that you would have made earlier this year dealing with call one. Um, this recommendation will be to include um, these projects within the current TIP. However, that does not actually place them in the TIP, and that's the next agenda item, which Josh will go through. Um, these are what we're calling special policy amendments um, to place both the call to projects um, that I'll be going through on this first action item, in addition to the call one recommendations into the actual TIP. The third action item deals with outcomes uh, from a call for projects that took place for those communities that are outside of the MPO, so the non-MPO area. And we'll go through that here in a little bit. Back to Josh uh, for our last action item, and these are what we're calling our regular policy amendments. Um, these are amendments that you will see most likely on a quarterly basis. So we do have a few of those, and, and we'll go through those. But before we get through the rest of those items, I did want to start with the call to recommendations. So um, just a, a briefer on sort of where we are in the process. Um, we're a total of four calls for projects, um, making up $452 million. That is available for Dr. Cog to allocate. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, earlier this year, we did make a recommendation for call one which is the regional call for the current 22 to 25 tip. Um, again, the action item highlighted for the sub-regional call, call two, that's where we are, we're at right now. Um, we are not stopping. We are actually in the middle of or nearing the end of call three. Um, call both calls three and four deal with the regional and sub-regional calls for a new tip that Dr. Cog is developing co covering 24 through 27. So this is a summary of the call to recommendations. Um, this call was open from May 2nd to June 24th, and this was for air quality and multimodal applications only. So uh, these projects that are being recommended must improve air quality and or congestion, um, the exact same as with call one. As we move into calls three and four for the new tip, we will certainly introduce additional funding on one additional funding source and additional project types that will be eligible. So within sub-regional calls for projects, um, the applications are actually not submitted to Dr. Cog. They go directly to the individual eight uh, sub-regional forums. Um, then each technical committee and or forum will go through the process to score, deliberate, and then recommending recommend projects within a particular funding target. Uh, so the table you see outlines the results from each of the eight forums. There was 59 total projects that were submitted among those eight forums um, that, were, that were requesting $186.2 million in funds. There was a funding target provided to each forum, as I mentioned, that totaled $173 million. So once each one of the forums went through their individual process, um, ultimately there were 50 projects that were recommended for funding um, that are also included, um, listed out individually within your agenda packet. The total of those 50 projects totaled $166.2 million. Um, so you'll note a couple things about that. It is less than the actual funding target of $173 million. Uh, so ultimately what this means, $6.8 million um, is now available to redistribute to calls three and four. 
Um, so we will simply come up with a brand new total for those two calls and then redistribute that new total 20% to call three, 80% to call four. You also note um, the highlighted asterisks next to Arapahoe County, and I will go through that uh, in the slide here. So in the end, the funding recommendations for the Arapahoe County Forum, um, their recommendations exceeded their funding target by 992,000. And within the Adams County Forum, um, they were able to recommend all of these submitted projects um, and, and make a recommendation for all of those projects, but it was under target by $6.4 million. So a little bit more background on how the town of Bennett sort of plays into all these discussions. When call two um, was, uh, the call for projects was happening, um, ultimately the town of Bennett submitted three individual projects. Two projects to the Adams County Forum and one project to um, the Arapahoe Forum. All three of these projects essentially form one um, new proposed trail going from the town of Bennett to the south of I-70. Within the Arapahoe County Forum, the lowest scoring project happened to be the one project that was submitted within the Arapahoe County Forum. And they were only able to recommend 394,000 of their one point, approximately $1.4 million request. At that time, um, Dr. Cog's staff sort of held discussions with both the technical members from the Adams and Arapahoe Forums, along with the town of Bennett, um, and our, a recommended action was sort of put forward um, by each forum. But the Arapahoe Forum would recommend allocating 992,000 of the remaining Adams Forum target to fund the remaining balance of the Arapahoe Forum submitted Bennett application. Ultimately, what this sort of made this project end up having to fund. Of the $1.4 million project request, 394,000 would be funded from the Arapaho Forum and 992,000 would be funded with the Adams remaining target. So as with call one, there was a continuation of a new tip process um, from Dr. Cog's staff to seek those public comments um, before the awards were recommended um, or before each forum went through their recommendation process. Um, so this call to process for the comment period happened from July 1st to July 20th. Um, the public were, was able to comment directly on a web map or through uh, more conventional means, email or phone. Um, we were able to get the word out through eblast, um, our website, and of course some social media and posting. Directly on that web map, um, commenters were able to indicate whether they had support, concern, or were opposed to the proposed project, in addition to being able to add specific written comments. In all, during that 20-day comment period, 165 comments were received, um, and of course forums were able to use those comments that were received within their deliberations and ultimately their recommendations. So before we get to next steps and moving into the actual motion, I uh, just wanted to take a quick step back and take a look at sort of what we found as some general results of both call one and the call two projects. Again, projects totaling $206, $206 million in Dr. Cog funds. But we wanted just to take a step back and, and see what that really looks like. Uh, 56 total project awards. 36 intersections will be improved for better operations for vehicle and vehicles and transit. Um, as a result of those 56 projects, approximately 60 miles of bike ped facilities eventually will be constructed. Of those 56 total awards, 13 of those are studies looking towards future awards. Uh, approximately three quarters of those projects will implement complete street elements. Um, in addition to 82% of them will have improved connections to transit. There's 29 unique individual agencies and sponsors across the region. Um, almost three quarters of those projects were in or near some urban centers um, and on the uh, Dr. Kai high injury network. Um, through the projections within the applications um, made by sponsors, it is projected 21 fewer fatal crashes and 135 fewer serious injuries over the next five years. Um, when looking at the actual population, population 
approximately one third of the total um, regional population will be affected by these projects. So just touching on next steps before we're going into the motion. Um, obviously, we're looking for your recommendation here this morning um, and then tomorrow night at the board looking for action um, for these call two projects. Um, I did go through briefly at the beginning how all of these action items sort of interact. Um, if action is successful tomorrow night um, at the board, um, those project sponsors will be receiving award notification emails. Um, later this week so they can begin their IGA process. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're right in the process of call three uh, that is open until October 11th. And then shortly right before um, or right after Thanksgiving, we will go ahead and open call four. So happy to take any comments or questions you may have, um, but the motion before you will be to move to recommend to the board the sub-regional share projects to be included within the current 22 to 25 tip. Thank you, Alvin. Um, Mr. Stewart, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, maybe that means I shouldn't speak. No, I'm off. No, I'm not. Okay, what I'm going to say isn't worth all that trouble to tell you the truth. <laughs> All right, what thank I wanted you. to say was I really applaud Dr. Cog doing this again. When we first started this project of sub-regional allocation, you know, there was some concern about whether that's the right way to allocate these funding uh, sources. And um, just looking at the uh, kinds of specific projects that um, communities within the region can fund and cooperatively, ha cooperatively have to fund together within their region, um, I just want to applaud this. I, I looked at these projects, and there's a great diversity of projects with all the components that you've just seen here. So just want to applaud Dr. Cog's effort. It was an out-of-the-box thinking a couple of years ago, and I think many of us thought, oh, I don't know. Oh, there are going to be certain special projects that are going to be politically motivated. And I have to say, really, congratulations. I think this is great. I'm fully in favor. Thank you. I think what I find interesting, um, Alvin, is your description of the Bennett project and yes. seeing the sharing of allocation across the sub-regions. No, exactly, um, Mr. Chair. It, it does sort of break some of the rules a little bit, um, but I think it does benefit um, the entire Exactly. It's, a, uh, it's to the benefit of, of ben, the regional ben. partnership. Ben, Ben. <laughs> ben. <laughs> Ends, but does not break. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Dr. Conklin, go ahead. I move to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board the sub-regional share projects to be included in the current fiscal year 2022-2025 tip. Thank you. Who's, uh, okay. Mr. Silverstein seconded. Any further discussion? Any questions? Seeing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? Great. Thank you very much. Pass unanimously. Uh, item six, uh, tip special policy amendments. Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as Todd laid out, um, you did just vote to recommend uh, approval of the sub-regional share projects, but we do need a separate action to actually amend those into the TIP. Um, so this special policy amendment would um, amend both the set of call two uh, sub-regional share projects, which you just voted on, as well as the call one regional share projects, which you voted on um, at your May meeting. Um, so just a couple points of clarification on the projects. There are 50 unique project changes uh, that will be made to the TIP. Um, and this is because some of the projects received both regional share and sub-regional share funds, um, and some received funds through multiple sub-regions. So those have been combined uh, within the changes that will be made to the TIP. Uh, these account for a total of $206,549,000 in new Dr. Cog funds being allocated to projects throughout the region. Um, so happy to take any questions on any of the projects um, that you may have. Otherwise, uh, there is a proposed motion available in your packet, um, and 
on the screen if you're able to make it out. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we don't have a 50 slide presentation on each project. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, explain to me again, uh, either Josh or Alvin, the difference between this and the prior motion. Because they, when I was reviewing this the other day, it seemed that, well, why are we doing this twice? So the first motion did not add these 50 projects to the 2225 tip. It did what? So the first motion was to approve the, the award for those call two projects. It did not actually add them to the tip. And call okay. one projects, which were previously voted on, were also not added to the tip to the at tip. that time. And that's what so this, this does. will add both of those sides. Okay. So the first was to recommend them, in, and then this is to include them in the, in the actual tip. Correct. Thank you. That's what I thought it was, but it just sounded very confusing, even after Alvin explained it up front. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Todd. <laughs> uh, any questions, any discussion on these? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Dr. Conklin. I move to recommend to the board of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors the attached project amendments from the TIP regional and sub regional share calls for project calls one and two to the fiscal year 2022 2025 transportation improvement program. Thank you. Direct, uh, seconded by Director Shaw. Any discussion? Questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Josh. Item seven, and this is Todd also, outcome of Dr. Cog non-MPO, multimodal transportation option funds, call for projects. Thank you, thank you. So again, we're I, hopefully this doesn't go down a rabbit hole. Um, I, we don't start going down that way. Um, but. Beginning four years ago, um, Dr. Cog received a new funding source from the state called State Multimodal Options Fund, or MMOF. Um, when Dr. Cog received this funding, um, it was allocated to the entirety of Dr. Cog, not just the MPO. Uh, so that at that time, Dr. Cog held a special call for projects um, for the non-MPO areas of Dr. Cog. This includes Gilpin and Clear Creek counties, um, and the eastern por portions of Adams and Arapahoe counties, which are east of Kiowa Creek. Last year, that funding source re was renewed approximately a 10-year time period. Um, so Dr. Cog um, staff went ahead and issued a, a new call for projects, again, for the non-MPO portions um, of Dr. Cog. This call for projects took place um, from May 2nd to June 24th, the same time period as um, the TIP call to process that we just went through. Um, this non-MPO call took um, the years available of funding from FY23 all the way out to 27 for $1.588 million. Um, so this was approximately 1% of the overall allocation to Dr. Cog during that time period. 1% um, because if we look at the overall population, employment, and VMT within the entire region, non-MPO portions equal that 1% of the total area. Um, so after the call closed on June 24th, there was one application that was received. Um, this was from the town of Bennett, or I'm sorry, the town of Deer Trail. Um, the request was for $500,000 for a side path along US 40 from Pine Street to Burton Avenue. So similar to call two, there was also a public comment period that was held um, so public comment could be received on this single project. Uh, however, there was no public comment that was received. Um, based, and based on this application, um, Dr. Cogstaff is recommending to, uh, to fund this request. Um, so with that, happy to take any comments or questions, um, but there is a motion here on your screen. There we go. Move to recommend to the board the project selected for funding from the non-MPO MMOF call for projects. Um, and one thing I will note, um, if there is approval from the board tomorrow night, this project will not be placed within the current TIP or any future TIP um, because there is no requirement to do so because it is outside the MPL boundary. So we will work directly with CDOT to make sure that does get placed within the TIP. 
Um, so they can work directly with CDOT on their IGA process. Excellent. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Any questions? Seeing none, would a member like to make a motion? Move to recommend to the board that the project selected for funding from the non-MPO MMOF call for projects. Thank you. Second, Director Shaw. Any comments before we vote? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Say no. Any abstentions? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. And now we have item eight. Josh, you're up again. 2225 TIP policy amendments. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. So um, in addition to the special policy amendments that you previously voted on, these would be the regular amendments that you would uh, see at one of your normal meetings. So um, I'll run through each of the five that we have today for you briefly. So the first is to the Region 1 Hazard Elimination Pool. It would be adding $8.5 million in state safety funding. And that's actually related to the second one for the Region 1 Faster Pool. One project is being removed from the faster pool and moved into the hazard elimination pool, and that's for the Denver West runaway truck ramp. Uh, next, we have the State Highway 119 corridor safety um, and mobility operational improvements. This would be adding $32,817,000 in state legislative funding for some additional scope that CDOT will be completing along that corridor. Um, and the final two projects are just switching uh, state multimodal options funds with uh, some federal multimodal options funds through the ARPA program. So that would be changing $2.4 million on the State Highway 7 and 95th Street project and all $5 million on the State Highway 119 and 63rd Street project. So happy to take any questions that members may have. Otherwise, I do have a motion available for you. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, I'd entertain the motion. Director Shaw. Thank you. I move to recommend the board or to the board the attached amendments to the fiscal year 2022 through 2025 Transportation Improvement Program tip. I have a second from uh, Director Williams. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Say no. Any abstentions? Hearing none, that is approved unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, we're on to item nine, uh, member comment, other matters. Uh, before we go to the CDOT report, are there any general matters from members? Seeing none, CDOT report. Jessica Mecklebus. Hello again. <clears throat> so a few of these we've already talked about, but a couple of things on the CDOT side, our 10-year plan was adopted by Transportation Commission, so we'll just keep celebrating that until it's old. <laughs> $100 million was awarded for Floyd Hill through the mega grants. We're really excited about that. Additional grant opportunities that we're pursuing. The Bridge Improvement Program, which came out through the IIJA, I believe that's what it stands for. We call it the BIP internally. So we pursued that, uh, the bridge bundle package that I was talking about along I-270. Um, and we also pursued the 6th and Wadsworth interchange, uh, which has a lot of multimodal improvements as well as a very outdated Cloverleaf configuration. So both of those have been submitted for the BIP. We're also looking at submitting um, I-25, uh, kind of the Central Valley part of I-25 under a new grant that I think the NOFO just released called SMART. I forget what the acronym stands for, but um, so lots of grants coming out through the IIGA. We're strategically looking at a lot of those and how we can leverage those dollars with our 10-year plan. And anything else from CDOT? Defer to the, our commissioners if you all wanted to add anything, but that on our end. Any commissioners? Commissioner Stewart. Our former executive director, Shailen Batt, is up for FHWA executive. Very excited about that. Bringing the um, experience that he had for several years at CDOT, being able to deliver projects and um, move some of our safety issues forward, we're really excited to have him and hope confirmed. Thank you. 
Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Stanton. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you would, I'd like to make a point about our efforts to uh, go to more e-bikes, to bicycles, motorcycles. And if you see the fatalities, we've had 102 so far motorcycle fatalities. Tragically, a mile from where I live, a 10-year-old boy was killed on an e-bike on Saturday night. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because with new disruptive technologies, such as scooters, et cetera, there's no um, complementary effort to have safety pieces, helmets, et cetera. I realize Dr. Cog is somewhat limited in what it can do, but since we're taking credit for <clears throat> greenhouse gas reductions, I think whenever possible, we need to make it clear that safety is recommended to our localities because um, I know Director Stewart has been involved with e-bikes extensively, and it's a, it's a wonderful technology, but there are trade-offs. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I would uh, note, since you brought it up, uh, that in Weld County, uh, Deputy Sheriff was riding a motorcycle in to start her shift and was struck and killed. Uh, so thank you for highlighting or more awareness of people on the road who have two wheels rather than four. Thank you. Uh, RTD report. Uh, I'd like to intercede for just a moment and introduce um, Brian Welsh, who is our new, what's your title? Manage senior AGM manager, whatever, something of planning. As you all probably remember, Bill Van Meter um, has retired. We miss him, but we we got a newer, better, younger version here. So. Oh, Bill, I'm going to tell Bill you said that he's a constituent of mine. So I'll uh, I like to talk to Karen. I'll turn this over to Brian. Welcome, Brian. Do you, are you acting in that role, or have you been appointed to that role? I'm, I'm act, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm acting in that role. Okay. So this is about a 20-minute 20, 20 item? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Director Williams. Um, the, uh, this is my, I'm starting my 12th year now at RTD and my 21st year actually in the Denver uh, metro area. So I've had the privilege of co collaborating with many of you over the years, and, I, and I'm looking forward to continuing that. Just let me give you a handful of highlights. And Director Williams, better, younger, either of those are true. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, uh, the upcoming regional call number three, I just wanted to highlight a couple of projects that I think of, uh, of interest that RTD is going to apply for. One would be uh, funding to assist us in conducting a maintenance facility study that would uh, help us identify where our next operating facility should be. We anticipate that particularly with the uh, overtime conversion to zero emission vehicles, have a thousand of these, and we know that we're going to need more operating capacity. So this study would allow us to identify and environmentally clear a new location for a, another operating division for RTD. We also have for some time wanted to take a look at what it would take to convert our entire light rail system to level boarding. Uh, we're one of the, I think we're the last one in the United States and maybe in all of North America that, that has high blocks. Now, that's a pretty big lift. Um, we have uh, 201 light rail vehicles. We have high blocks. We've got downtown, but this study would allow us to take a look at that. And then a couple other things I'll highlight, the board of directors has uh, taken an initial look at the midterm financial plan. There's two or three things included in there that, that I think are of interest. One, we'd like to, again, take a look at what it would take to make our entire set of bus stops, there's over 9,000 of them, ADA compatible. That's quite, a, quite an effort. We also are going to ask for funds to support Dr. Cog, CDOT, and other agencies in bus rapid transit, environmental, and preliminary engineering work. We, as you know, don't have money programmed to build those projects, but we would certainly like to be uh, at the table and contribute to them, uh, not just as an operator, but as a financial partner in some way. And then finally, um, partnerships. We're going to ask the board to provide additional dedicated funding for a formalized partnership program that would allow local jurisdictions 
to partner with us and CDOT and Dr. Cog on innovative types of mobility options that we think are going to provide a much broader set of solutions here in the region. And then uh, one other highlight, we in August successfully submitted our Colfax Small Starts rating application. We've already heard back from FTA. They have a few questions, but we're looking forward to being included in the president's budget next year. So that's a major milestone for uh, what we regard as the first of what we hope are a series of transformational, exciting bus rapid transit projects here in the region. So thank you very much. Thank you. That was the fastest 20 minutes I've ever lived through. <laughs> Any questions for either CDOT or RTD from anyone? Thank you. Next meeting is October 18th. Seeing no other business before the RTC, we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>